the meeting. So it's good to see everybody. Let me introduce myself real quick. I'm Tim Wilson. I'm the uh, president of the Minnesota Archers Alliance. Uh, it's good to see everybody, lots of familiar faces. Uh, the MAA is the NFAA and the USA Archery affiliated state or organization in Minnesota. So we're really great. To, we're excited to have uh, Chuck and Grant uh, and we're excited to have everybody here to answer some questions about turning pro and what that means. So I'm actually, I was kind of got interested in this recently because uh, the Iowa Pro-Am this coming weekend will actually be my first tournament as a pro. I'm going to be shooting in the senior pro division, first tournament ever. Um, I stopped over at A1 Archery and talked to Grant at one time and said, Grant, should I do this? And he was he was really encouraging to me, and I've uh, we've talked. I've talked to some other uh, pros in Minnesota and elsewhere too. So I decided to make that jump, but I thought it would be really fun to just have a conversation with Grant. And then Chuck Cooley is here too, and Chuck is the NFAA Pro Chair. Uh, has been a pro for a number of years as well, and Grant, uh, Chuck is going to help us understand some of the requirements and benefits also of being in the in the pro classes. And so I'm just going to start. Uh, Real quick, just have one grant. Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and, and Chuck, introduce yourself a little bit. And I've got a couple questions for you. Okay, Grant, go ahead. Hi, uh, Grant, everyone pretty much, uh, I don't know that everyone knows me, but most people know me. Been around for quite a while, shooting for 42 years now, competing for 39 of them. Uh, actually, take that back, competing for 40 of them because I'm now 47. So I've been competing a long time. Uh, every I didn't turn pro until 2007 is when I turned pro and have been ever since. Um, I've been very fortunate to have a very good career in archery. I've probably made more friends than I ever thought I could have from every part of the world. And I've been able to shoot with some pretty class act people. Um, helped me grow as a person and an archer, but more or less a person than anything else. Thanks, so, Grant. I'll leave with that. Chuck, we've got three years before Grant turns 50. So we got we to gotta make hay. We got to make hay while we can until Grant, Grant joins us in the geezer division. Uh, um, let me tell you about the geezer division. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's this guy named Tim Gillingham. Yep. Uh, there's, uh, there's a guy named Keith Trail. There's mm -hmm. a guy named uh, Kendall Woody. Um, Rio's coming up. Yeah, is he? Yeah, he's got to be in his mid forties. Got to be getting close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, George Riles technically can compete as a as a master uh, or a senior, but I, I I don't think he's really ready to give up the <laughs> dream yet. Um, yeah, dude, there's some powerhouses uh, in the in the senior division or the master division. I mean, if you if you looked at any of the highlights at the tournament that took place with Joe Cap last weekend, uh, with the vintage, he had, he had a vintage tournament and you had to have all old gear and, you know, some of the names that showed up to that thing and some of the scores they laid, laid down with bows that are 20, 30 years old were, were just incredible. So I'm, I'm glad I don't have to compete against the 18, 19, 20 year olds. Cause it's ridiculous. I mean, just the scores are mind blowing. Um, but the the seniors and the masters aren't uh, they, they aren't far off of that. Um, but like Grant said, you know, I I've been I started in I started in ninety eight, um, and I think I turned pro in the mid two thousands. And I did it back then. I did it more because um, I hated getting out of bed at 4 a.m. to be on a seven o'clock line in Louisville. Uh, so I was like, wait, the pros shoot later. OK, yeah, I can. I'm, I'll just shoot pro because I was there for my business anyway. So uh, for me, it was it was a marketing thing and a way for me to get into a different group. Um, but I'll second what Grant says, you know, the. The people that I've met on the road over the last 22 or three years, uh, 24 years, uh, are some of the closest friends I've, I've got in the world. I mean, they're just amazing, amazing people that I keep in touch with 
some more than my own family. And uh, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing that I stumbled into archery. Um, and, and I'm, I'm just really thankful and really blessed that, you know, what I've been able to do has, has propelled me to where, where I am in the industry and, and what I'm able to accomplish. And I can remember, you know, we were talking off camera here a little while ago and, you know, I remember seeing Grant at the shoot off in Lancaster. And, you know, I remember seeing some of these guys that were just cubs. Uh, and in fact, I, my practice range is at uh, Watkins Glen, um, up at the Seneca Lodge. And if you've been, if you've done field archery, any part of your life, you've shot, uh, Sugar Hill before. And, uh, in that, in that book of signatures is like Jim Despart when he was 10 or 11 years old, you know, and it's, it's pretty incredible to go back and see some of those old names when they were just kids. It's, it's really cool. That's awesome. Thanks, Chuck. Grant, I want to ask you specifically what, you know, you obviously had been shooting a while before you turned pro, quite a while. In fact, I'm sure you had won your share of tournaments. I'm sure you were being, you know, very successful in the amateur ranks. What, what exactly was it that prompted you to take that next step and join the pro, pro ranks? Well, you know, uh, I did, I shot bow and a freestyle for the longest time. And, uh, I shot a lot of 60 X's and a lot of 59s, 58s, 57s, had a couple of shoot offs at nationals. Richard Potter was one, oh. um, just some really, really good people. I got to meet and shoot with Lee Gibbs, Dwayne Price, everyone from Wisconsin. Um, so many other people that I can't remember half their names. Um, I, I just, I, I really wanted to win nationals and I was so close so many times. And then in 2007, I just, um, my, it was shortly after my dad was through his first bout of cancer. And I was like, you know, I'm watching all these other people. At that time, I don't want to say it was a little more freer in the archery industry being a pro where you could get a few items and you could get some help with product. Um, you still can now, but now there's a lot more commitment. And obviously in this day and age, cost has gone up. So everything now has a bigger value than it did did before. So you have to you have to take that for granted. But, you know, myself example, I still shoot a Hoyt, um, and I rep, rep represent Hoyt, but I don't really fully have a contract because I don't shoot enough. So I have to have the reality of I'm the weekend warrior, but I won't shoot amateur at the moment. I don't feel like I should. I. I have the chance and the ability every single time I step to that line to shoot just as good as anyone out there. And I realized that and about around that 2007 era. And I decided, you know, I'm going to make, make the jump. And everyone's like, man, you go to a, you go to a dot. It's a scope. It's completely different. Your score. Don't, don't worry. Your scores will go down. They'll come back up and everything. And, you know, they were kind of right. I, uh, I borrowed a bow from a buddy of mine. I borrowed a Matthews apex. And I set it up two weeks before Vegas. I went to Vegas. I shot a 300 with 25, a 300 with 24, and a 300 with 27 and made the shoot off the first year there as an unsponsored pro. And when I left, I was fortunate enough to have a couple of good conversations with Matthews. And I was offered a contract before I even left the building. And that was unbeknownst to me because several of my other friends and peers and pros had already went to Matthews and approached them and talked to them on my behalf. And that right there proved to me that it wasn't really about archery. It was more about the family of archery. And since then, uh, as Chuck has said, we've, uh, there is so many names. I could go on a list of, of, we could be here for 35 minutes just talking about the names of the people. But it made me realize how much I was missing. You, you learn a lot in archery, but when you get on that pro line, there is so many things that we learn over time on tweaking and setups and things that matter and don't matter. And everyone has their own ideas and you're always gonna have those same arguments on, well, I set it up this way and I set it up that way. There's a thousand ways to set up, set up a boat, but there's every way to set the thing up wrong. And there's every way to go down a rabbit hole. You don't need to go down. And as pros, we discuss a lot of that stuff and we'll talk about little things like, hey, did you think about putting a half a twist here or taking a quarter turn out there? Or did you even think of trying to put a shim on this side instead of that side 
And I'm like, no, why would I think of doing that? And then all of a sudden you start talking. Next thing you know, you're rebuilding the bow on the line in the middle of your score. And I, I, I've been known to change my drawing from the middle of my round and not phase me at all. I take a half a turn in, a half a turn out, put a turn in, put a turn out, make a couple, couple clicks. Doesn't even affect me because I know my equipment. And then on top of that, what I've learned is through all this, that it made me way better of an archer than I ever thought I could be. And, and you know, scores are scores. You can, you can talk about that all day long. And everyone knows some of the best archers don't even shoot the best, best scores. But the people they are and how they approach people and how they talk to people. I mean, Chuck and I have both had the example of certain pros that have not been so nice. You know, you ask them a question. I'm busy right now. Well, they do have a job. So you have to respect that. Yeah. But then also there's others of us that are like, yeah, man, this, this is my job. My job is to be interrupted in the middle of the line at Vegas while I'm shooting my score to win $50,000 to sign your shirt. Yes, please let me. You know, you just have to accept certain things. And I, I just, I, I've, I'm telling you, there, there's anyone who wants to, I always encourage them to, because not only do we need more archers to do it, to help promote, to help show and grow, that the more you do to help them, it helps you in turn. You learn from someone else. That's constantly how we, we evolve from it. So I, I'm glad I did when, when I did. And again, I've been very fortunate to have a really good, good career. Um, the older I get, as we know, the harder it is to stay as steady as you were when you're younger, but um, things improve. So does technology. And, and hopefully, you know, if the right pigs come along, I can run their veins and, you know, I can shoot for another 45 years. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Grant. I appreciate that. Chuck, how about you? What have you how would you say you've benefited personally as an archer um, in, in your in your years as a, an NFA pro? I I have a really unique experience. I think um, much much different than a lot of other pros. Uh, in that, when I started, um, I I had a business in the archery industry before I had a bow. Um, I, I make scope lenses and, and I have since 1998 and I got into it. I got into that because a customer of mine at my eyeglass store was like, Hey, you know, can you make me a, a little bitty lens? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then he told me what it was for. And I, I thought he was full of it. So I had him bring in his gear and I was like, wow, that's, that's really pretty cool. Um, so I wanted to get into archery because of the business that I had. And I was like, all right, I, I need a bow and I need to learn how to shoot. Um, and it, and it was a few months, you know, that I was out on the road and I could tell people, look, man, you can definitely see better, but I didn't understand where they were coming from and their experiences. And this is what I see. And this is what the target looks like. And I can't see, you know, into that tunnel of trees and, I, I didn't have any frame of reference. So my very first bow was a, was a Martin. I bought it from uh, Randall Jones. I don't know if you guys remember that. Grant probably remembers him. He's old enough to remember Randall Jones. Uh, he was a lefty and, uh, and he was a Martin shooter. And back then, man, if you didn't shoot Martin, you didn't shoot. It was like, forget it. Oh yeah. You know, there was, they were it. So I bought a couple of left-handed Martin bows and, uh, I started shooting and about a year, year and a half later, I figured out that you just can't get left-handed gear. So I'm pretty ambidextrous. So I was like, fine, I'll shoot right-handed. So I went out and I bought a right-handed Matthews and, uh, I shot a Matthews for, oh gosh, two, three years. Uh, I want to, I want a couple of national buckles. Uh, in the NFAA and Reading as an amateur uh, shooting. What the heck was that? Oh my gosh. It was uh, the ultra max, I think is what it was called. It was a little bitty thing. Um, and uh, then I tried uh, Stuart Bowman. Do you remember him? Stuart Bowman bows. Um, I won a national championship buckle with a Stuart Bowman bow in Reading. Um, then I switched over to 
Uh, Limb Saver, when they first came. Oh, no, Botech after that. I went to Botech. I was a Botech guy for a long time, like seven or eight years. And the same thing as like Grant, you know, back then it was, you know, you were, you were either getting a, a really good deal on a bow or maybe if you're lucky, you'd get a free one here or there. Um, but I was traveling a lot. You know, I was doing the entire IBO circuit, the entire ASA circuit, the entire NFAA circuit, most of the USA archery circuit and holding down a full-time day job and having a, a, a vendor uh, booth at, at the tournaments. So the, the experience that I had was I was getting gear at either free or reduced prices because I was out there. Um, I may not be winning, but I was competitive and I was visible and I was talking to a lot of people and sharing my experiences with the various products and, and the vendors found great value in that. Uh, and then I met the guys from Limb Saver and, uh, I was a paid shooter for that company for a long time. And then I moved to PSE and I was a paid archer for them. Uh, and then I, I moved to Hoyt um, five years ago, I think. I've been six years maybe now. Um, I moved to Hoyt and, and it, it's getting harder and harder and harder. You know, the paychecks in the archery industry are not at all what they used to be. You know, it used to be back in the day, you know, a 10, 15, $20,000 contract was like, ah, ho-hum, right? I mean, there was a lot of people getting three, four, five, 600 bucks a weekend for travel money, or, you know, they'd get, they'd get five or six bows, but they'd get no cash, but they could sell all the bows if they wanted to and turn that into cash, right? There was a lot of ways to work around it. And, and with the economy changing over the last decade or so, and especially over the last two years, uh, that stuff is dried up. I mean, the, the guys that were making 40, 50 grand are getting contracts, 10, 15, 20 grand with performance contingency attached to it. You know, uh, Matthews is famous for that, that the, Matthews expects performance, um, a great company, great gear, but they're not just going to give you money and say, have a good time. You, you better bring something back to the table when you're when you cash the check. Um, and Hoyt and PSE are very much the same way. You know, when you get into those bigger companies, they that that attitude is shifted. You have to bring value. And if you're not winning, you better be selling bows. You better be at the table. You better be signing autographs. You, you have to earn your keep one way or the other. Now, if you're if you're a top 10, top 20 archer in the world or in the country, they're not really expecting that, right? Hey, swing by, say hi, do your thing. But if, if, you're, if you're one of the top, top, top tier, they know that you've got stuff to do, right? Your job is to be winning that tournament and, and they get that. So, uh, but they're using you in other ways. They're using you in marketing. They're using you in imagery. They're using you in Facebook and things like this. So there's, there's a bit of a trade-off there. Now that said, I remember the days, and I'm sure Grant remembers these days as well, you know, when, when I was first in the game and I'm like, dude, I got a sling contract, you know, I'm going to get all the bow slings in the world and, and it, it, nothing, nothing on the vein deal. But back then, you know, I was like, wow, I got a, I got a vein contract. And I didn't think a vein contract was a big deal until I had to buy freaking veins. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, I just ordered $600 worth of veins. And, you know, it's so it's the little things. And I don't want to take that away from the from the guys who are starting out because they're like, well, I got a string deal or I got this rest or, I, you know, I got this widget or that shiny thing or this shiny thing. And it's man, I remember that. And I feel that. And I remember how excited I was to be that guy that looked like the NASCAR driver. Because back then, you know, our shirts were embroidered. I can remember paying $700 to have a shirt embroidered, 700 bucks. But it was beautiful. I had two or three of them. But God forbid you change it to sponsor. And it was like, oh, dude, I just put 40,000 stitches into a back of a shirt that's worthless. So... 
Yeah, you remember those days, right? See? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, guys are like, wow, shirts are a hundred bucks these days. Hundred bucks? I'd have been thrilled to have been paying a hundred bucks 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. So you know, I don't want to take anything away from these these guys who are breaking into the industry, whether they're amateurs or pros or or whatever, who are who are picking up these smaller contracts because they're really important. It gets you out there in front of the uh, in front of the right people, and it teaches you how to be an ambassador, right? Because I don't want to be just a I don't want to be just a promoter. I I don't want to be like, well, yeah, this is the greatest string I've ever shot, or this is the greatest bow I ever shot, or the greatest rest, or the greatest vein, or or whatever, right? I, I, I don't want to be that guy. And I don't think any of the pros want to be that guy, or that girl where they say, oh, yeah, this is the best bow I've ever shot. And then 2022 rolls around, oh, this is the best bow I ever shot. Right. And so I think the companies are really looking for people who can be proper ambassadors. And what I mean by that, and that, that's what I look for in a pro, is can you clean yourself up a little bit? Um, can you put together a sentence? Can you talk to a kid without cussing? Can you not look like an ass on the line? Um, can you not break arrows when you're walking back from the target? Because I've seen it happen. Can you not hurl your bow through the woods when you miss? I mean, it's silly little stuff like that, you know, can, can you be an ambassador for the sport that's been around for literally thousands of years? And can you push it forward? Can you leave it better than you found it a few years ago? And I don't care if you're a pro for a year, two years, 10 years, or 40 years, can you leave it better than you found it? Can you, can you push it a little farther forward? And if possible, possible, can you drag a couple of companies with you so that they're doing a little bit better than they were before? And if you're lucky, you'll do okay. You know, the way that I look at archery is I make just enough to kind of pay my tab, right? I'm not making money at archery. I I think there's very, very few of us that are making money at archery. You know, the years ago, I talked to Dave Cousins about that. And, and Dave was one of the very first guys to ever go straight from school to being a pro shooter. And he's like, look, man, January 1st, I'm 80,000 in the hole. That's it. I know it every single year. January 1, I'm 80 grand in the hole. That's travel. That's gear. That's whatever he's got to do. But he also does it smart. He has health insurance. And he has a retirement plan and he funds that retirement plan because he knows one of these days he's not going to be winning and he's going to have to, you know, still keep a roof over his head. So that's what it takes. You know, these days you got to generate 80 to a hundred grand. If you want to be a full time day job kind of shooter, you know, the government's going to take a lot of money. Your travel expenses are going to take a lot of money and, and you may not win as much as you want to win. So if you can just pay your way and not go on the hole and uh, not leave your family short, I mean, as it is, we're away from the house and we're practicing, you know, four or five, six days a week in the peak season, you know, it's a nice sunny day and the family's going out on the boat and you're going to the tree line to shoot rubber deer and you know it's it's hard on a lot of families and it's hard on a lot of people and you you really have to uh get married to one side of that or the other it's i've seen it destroy some families and i've i've seen it really tear some people up and i've seen it really bring some people together there's a there's a heck of a lot of positives to being a pro shooter um and there's some perks i mean you get to shoot a little later you get to have a little nicer lane to shoot in. Um, maybe you get some deals on some gear. Maybe a kid comes up and asks you for an autograph. And I'll tell you right now, man, kid comes up and asks me for an autograph. I just about want to burst into tears every time because it just means the world when, when somebody does that. But like, you know, Grant was talking too, you know, with the tips and tuning and the tricks and all that other stuff, I really enjoy uh what it takes to be a pro right like like i'm not i'm not a tim gillingham i'm not a jesse broadwater but i strive to be 
And the reason I shoot in the pro division is because I don't think the adult division pushes me enough. Like, like if I go to a, an adult division event, right, where there's no pros, so I'm just going to donate my card, right? Um, I don't feel pushed to dominate or do my best. I, it's really hard to be motivated to go, yeah, I just want to crush these guys. Versus in the pro ranks, you know, it's like, I really want to hang. I really want to be in the mix. I really want to do my best. And so that's what I get out of the pro division is that internal push to just try a little harder, just be a little more motivated, just shoot a little bit better of a shot um, for my own sanity, because I just don't think I get the push uh, elsewhere. So, but it's, it's been an amazing experience and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Thanks, Chuck. I appreciate that uh, context and that kind of a little bit of, uh, in some sense, kind of the hard truth of what it really is like to, to be a pro. I appreciate that. Um, Chuck, I wanna just, uh, before we get into some questions, I wanna just invite you to share a little bit about what are the specific requirements to get your pro card? I, I went through this, through this just a few months ago when I got my pro card but I just wanted to take yeah, a couple really minutes and just review. You said you got that because I thought for sure I denied that. Yeah, right. You must have in a in a in a moment of weakness. You uh, you gave I, the. I have the email, Chuck. So if anybody I, is doubting, I. I'm I'm certain Natalie misread that. I I. <laughs> Wait, who is who is the one that actually sponsored him? Who's the one that said it was a good idea for him? To be I know this in the first place. This I, I thought he guy. said it was, he said it was you. And I was like, there's no way Grant approved. This. <laughs> he's, he's way too smart for that. Uh, right. <laughs> All right. Enough of bashing Tim. Uh, Chuck, <laughs> Chuck, Chuck, take us through it. What are you the, know what would have gotten what he, you, you would have gotten through a lot faster if you were shooting the proper veins, actually, I it would have been a, just a blanket approval. <laughs> <laughs> there you go dirt <laughs> um well to be a pro um there's there's a lot of things i would like to say that you need to do to be a pro um but i kind of pull the reins back a little bit on stuff so there is a score requirement now it's not an incredibly high score requirement but it is a score requirement you have to shoot within 3% of perfect at a state sectional or national event, right? So, or 3% of the winner's score, which in the adult men and the adult women is basically perfect. So uh, like on, an, in, on a blue face, you got to shoot a 300 and I think it's 48 or 47 X's. 40, 47 for the men. Right, which, which is not a terribly high number, um, but it does show proficiency, right? You're not going to win a tournament with 47 axes at all. You're not even going to come close. Um, but anybody that can shoot 47 axes, they know what they're doing. And the reason I did that number, I mean, and, and people were like, oh, you should make it higher. And I'm like, it's 3% within perfect. It's, do you realize how good that is? I mean, hell, golf's not even close to that. And well, at any rate, so, so basically 3% within the winning score, right? And the, the key reason I came up with that is, let's say you're, you're at an event. And, and you're on the pro line and, and you're shooting and you just come off the line and somebody comes up and, and they say, you know, geez, I'm shooting the same bow as you. Uh, and I'm, I'm really having a hard time with tuning or I can't get these arrows to fly or maybe, uh, you know, I want to try this arrow or I want to try this rest or this sight. As an archer that can shoot that level, you should be able to carry on a decent conversation and guide that other archer in a manner that won't get them hurt, right? 
well, I'm shooting 60 pounds, 32 inch draw. Yeah. You know what you need? 500 spine arrows. That, that'll, that'll do it for you. Right. So we're not going to have that situation where, where somebody's going to get hurt from bad advice. So, so that was, that was one prerequisite um, because it, it does show that proficiency. The other thing that I wanted was to get rid of the archery shop pros. And when I did an analysis, what I found was there was a bunch of guys who carried pro cards that I had never seen in 20 years. I had never once laid eyes on them and I'd been in every damn state. So what I learned was they were buying, they were just buying a pro card and they would hang it up in the shop and people would come in and they say, well, I'm an NFAA pro. So you can trust what I say. And that guy didn't know his ass from third base. And he was capitalizing on something that he shouldn't have been capitalizing on. So uh, look, you got you to gotta go to a state, a sectional, or a national event. Now, I would love to put in a minimum attendance requirement. I would absolutely love to do that. Um, and I, I, I may approach it in two years when we come up to our next vote, that you have to attend it, at least one of those, either your own state, your own sectional, which is a little bit farther a drive, probably a hotel or a national. But now a national, you know, you go to a national, now you're, you're a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks deep on a weekend, right? It's really hard for me to look at a guy in the face with conviction and go, that's the price of admission. You have to go to a national once a year. Well, I don't know if he's got four kids and, and a wife and a day job that's not really cooperative. And, you know, maybe he's got a sick parent or something like that. And he, and he just can't travel, right? It's, it's not feasible for him to do that just to keep a pro card where he, he's not making any money by carrying the card anyway. Now, if this was golf or NASCAR or, hell, um, beanbags uh, lately or darts or, hell, they have a professional axe throwing league now um, where those guys are making serious money, ah, I, I might be able to put it in there. So I think a state or a sectional or a national minimum attendance once a year, just to, hey, look, you got to come out and do your thing, right? And your state shoot, hell, everybody ought to be able to go to their state shoot. It's not that far away, no matter where you live. Um, so that's what it takes in terms of proficiency and skill. The rest of it is just being a basic, decent human being, right? Can you carry on a conversation? Can you not be a jerk? Can you, can you wear not jeans? Um, and I know that was a big sticking point for a lot of people for a long time. They're like, well, wait, why a dress code? There's no dress code anywhere else. Well, there's a dress code everywhere. Literally every organization has a dress code, whether it be shirts or pants or jeans or whatever, every single organization has a dress code. Um, I would love to say you could wear jeans again. The problem is people show up with rips and tears and stains or they show up and they're bedazzled themselves to death and they look they can't sit down on a chair because all the diamonds are going to poke their cheeks out so it was easier for me to say okay look let's let's see if we can show some unity here if everybody just gets behind the dress code i know we can coalesce as a group and and we could try to get some things done and that was really important with the nfaa back in the day, because we were trying to show the NFAA organization that the, the pros were uh, a solid group of people that, that could uh, be worthy of their promotion. And I think you've seen that over the last few years, you know, you see, you know, when you go to Vegas, you see the banners with the winners hanging there and you see, you know, the pros on the covers of the magazine and you're seeing a lot more involvement um marketing wise from the pros um not that i don't think the nfaa would have done it otherwise but i think it was accelerated and i think we just kind of moved that bar up just a little bit uh of expectation um and i think it's carried over into a lot of a lot of different venues um and a lot of different a lot of different ways
you mentioned it earlier, Chuck, but you're also required to have a mentor. And so in my case, I asked Grant yep. if he would do that. He he's sort of your mentor mentor sort of co-signs in a way on your on your application. And the intent yeah. is that, that somebody you can ask a question of in that, especially in that first year, maybe uh, somebody who can just kind of help steer you down the right path. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. The mentor, they used to call it a sponsor. Um, but back in the day, um, you know, sponsor, the, the word sponsor uh, had a different connotation. Um, you know, it was like when you got into the Elks Club or something like or the Moose Lodge, um, you know, you had to have a sponsor. Um, and, and in this case, we, we don't, it's not a, it's not an equipment sponsor or anything like that. It's, it's a mentor and it's exactly what you describe. Somebody that you can reach out to that you have a comfortable relationship with that you can ask a question to and say, Hey man, what, what about this? Or what about that? Or should I do this? Or should I, shouldn't I do that? Um, that maybe you don't feel comfortable calling me or calling headquarters about, but you still have a question. So, and, and the mentor also um, is important because we've had a couple of situations where we get a rookie in and then they, they do something really silly and I've got to call up their mentor and go, Hey, um, you, you're going to have to put your boy in check um, because he stepped out of line a little bit. And I, I don't want to jerk his chain too hard, but if, if you could say something to him to maybe not, do that again would be fantastic. Um, so that's where that mentor thing comes in is it gives us uh, from the NFAA side, gives me a little bit of buffer, um, but it also really gives the archer somebody that they can rely on for information. So we, we do require that that mentor be a pro as well. And Chuck, the, the other thing I wanted to just have you uh, just remind everybody ever talk about a little bit is the expectation that um, a, a pro will always shoot in a money or pro class if one is offered. Can you just kind of detail that that rule a little bit? Because I think that can be a little confusing for some. Yeah, that one gets a lot of questions. Um, so the deal is this. Um, we realize that there are a lot of events um, that, that call themselves pro events um, or they'll have a championship line or they'll have a money line. Um, and that's, if you're a card carrying pro, that's where you shoot. You shoot for the money every time, no exceptions. Doesn't matter where you go, you're shooting for money. Um, the ASA has a mandatory crossover rule. If you shoot NFAA pro, you have to shoot ASA pro or semi pro. And the IBO has that same rule that if you shoot pro, um, you've got to shoot in their semi or their pro division as well, um, which means you're shooting for money. Um, when you go to a club shoot or a local shoot or even a good size regional shoot, if there's money on the line, that's where you go. If there's money and a trophy, you go for the money and the trophy. If they give you a really cool belt buckle or they give you a really cool thing to hang on the wall, go win it. But make sure it comes with a check. If it's just a trophy and there's no money, you can go shoot, but you tear up your card because you're not in the business of taking trophies from amateurs. You are in the business of taking their money if they think they want to come up. It's just like you sitting down at the table and playing poker with Negrano. Negrano will play poker with you for money, and he will take your money. And so will the pros. They will take your money. But if it's just a trophy, you know, go have fun, shoot your bow, tear up your card, you know, give the guys something to talk about, you know, Maybe share some tips and some tricks and things like that. Give them, give them some help and some feedback. Have a good time. Go support your organizations and go support your clubs. Just do not take a trophy from an amateur, period. End of story. You're not allowed to do that. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. I appreciate that clarification. I know that comes up. It was a question I had too, so it's really good to know. Those are the basics. I want to just throw it open now uh, for some questions. Uh, are there any 
anybody, if you're in the in the room and you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Everybody, pretty much everybody's muted right now. So just unmute yourself. You feel free to ask a question and we'll have these two guys uh, weigh in. I just awesome. wanted to say um, that if you, you know, obviously the contingencies are a great way to win money and and if you can get a contract from someone, fantastic. But as a uh, manufacturer, there are other ways that that pros or even amateurs can get paid um, to do this. I started the industry 30 years ago doing seminars and things like that and in kind of Grant's backyard in the River Falls area. And and there are ways to do that. You just need to ask your brands because they're always we're always looking for help to do things. And uh, there are ways to do that, to earn money, to to pay for a shoot or to help out do this kind of stuff or that kind of stuff. And then one thing I wanted to ask Grant, because I knew this 30 years ago and saw this, is that as a pro or a pro am, you walk into a shop and the retailer goes, oh no, here they come again, carrying their fancy quiver and everything else. And 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 how how do you, how does that how do you see that as a retailer today, Grant? And I mean, we Chuck knows this, and and other folks that the pros are helping the brands make money so they can pay the pros and, and to do things. And but they, there's a tie to retail, but you can't be arrogant and cocky in a retail setting. And how do you, as a pro, help out your local retailer? And, and your brands, your sponsors at the same time? Well, I can say that uh, working at A1 now, I went full-time at A1 about just over a year ago. I was working full-time at 3M and uh, I missed being in the retail setting. I used to work at Shields a while back and Dan Ellison and I, the owner had a good talk and uh, he believed in me probably a little more so than I believed in myself on my ability to, I was working there part-time just helping out after hours because they needed some help and it was a busy season. And I've learned a lot from Dan on the bow side of working on bows and doing bows because I could predominantly just tune target bows, a hunting bow. I set it up, I eyeball it. It looks great. But when you get to the shop setting, you do as much detail in the hunting bows, you do a target bow. And I can tell you from personal experience, I don't boast at all to anyone that walks in the door who I am. All my coworkers do, and I don't. I stand back and try and stay as humble as possible as I can. I don't, I don't, um, I don't want to say I down talk myself, but I downplay everything because I'm no one special. I'm not. Uh, I've just been very fortunate to have a really, really good career. And what I say, I can back. I have the proof. I have uh, 13 state championships. I have three perfect scores in my state. No one's ever done that. Um, I've got, I've never won nationals. I've been in a couple of shoot offs. Uh, won Vegas as an amateur. Um, I've won uh, a couple other small events. Um, I, sectionals, I think I've got four or six sectionals. Uh, shot clean once there. Um, shot clean a few times at nationals. Been in three shoot-offs there. Been in three shoot-offs in the pros in Vegas. I, I, I've proven my, my worth. Um, yeah. But when people walk in the door, I just tell them my view tell them what we've learned at the shop and they'll be like well uh, in an example one guy came in and said uh he goes hey uh, you should probably fix my d-loop too what why what's wrong wrong with your d-loop what's tied wrong oh why is it tied wrong i tied it on earlier well youtube told me it's wrong i said oh okay i get it no problem i how do you want me to tie it? i'll tie it for you because this is the exact same way i tied on all all of my, my bows and currently i don't have any issues so explain to me what I need to do for you. Cause I will gladly do it. I, I will change everything I know and do it just the way you need it, but explain to me. And after a couple of talks, he's like, yeah, I guess I probably shouldn't listen to YouTube as much. I'm like, you can, if you want to, but there's a whole genre of separate archery that belongs on YouTube and stays on YouTube. Um, but I do, I do see, and I am, I am consistently trying to grow and Chuck knows this and you know this in an archery shop that's predominantly hunting you don't target archery isn't a, a business winner. You don't model a business around target archery. Target archery is a bonus, a bonus only. And I'm trying to rebuild um, 
a target persona in our our area. You know, I, I've I've managed this year with my coworkers. I don't want to say just me because it's not that, but building my coworkers' knowledge on target bows and how I tweak them and what I do and what I'm looking for in setups. And a couple of guys, and we got I, we got one of the guys that worked with us. He's a former Army Ranger, and this dude in a year, the last six months, I've watched him change his shooting from like a 280 to he shot a 297 Vegas the other day. And that's just little things I've been helping him do. And he, he's, he's hooked, hooked line and sinker in. And him himself has talked and shown the passion. And when these other archers come in and see that passion, now I've got guys that are predominantly hunting guys buying target bows just because they want to, because I want to try it. I want to do it. And then they come out and I'll be in the shop shooting and they'll come out and shoot and go, you can shoot. Yeah, I have my good days. So there's, there's been a, a you know, it's, it's different in the retail, in the retail area because you don't get to stock it. I don't have 37 target bows on the wall. I don't have 47 sites on the wall. Hunting stuff, you have every option galore. Target stuff, and nowadays with supply chain shortage, it's, it's tough to get stuff in stock. It's tough to find stuff. Manufacturers are backed up six to eight months for a target site. Well, this is prime time. So now you're, you're trying to tap every resource you can just to get something in that. And, uh, and a small little tidbit is I have the same thing. A good friend of ours, his daughter is autistic and she's left-handed on top of it. And she's, she was shooting a Matthews uh, a veil, I think. And I had this left-handed Hoyt Pro Complete given to me and it managed to fit her. Problem was, is I didn't have any left-handed cams and finding the number two, G, number two or number one GTX left-handed cam is almost nearly impossible. So I had a yeah. good conversation with George Riles and I said, hey, theoretically, could I build this upside down? He goes, yeah, I've seen it done once. I said, okay. So I did. I built the bow upside down, the yokes on the bottom, cams on the top. She shot her highest score already and is shooting that bow and loves that bow to death. And I rebuilt it upside down. So <laughs> you're going to have people changing all sorts of crap. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I might get some flack on that one. Um, yeah. But it's just it's stuff like that, that you get them involved. And and, and Chuck knows this, too. I, I can completely ad, ad, admire to him the same way. When a kid comes up and asks for an autograph, I've had like four or five do that. And it just blows me away every time. And there's one picture from Vegas years ago. I was kneeling down. I got a picture with a kid and that kid's grin is past his ears. And, and again, to me, I, I never think I'm anyone special. I know my dad taught me a lot um, to just try and stay humble, but man, I'll tell you, that really makes you feel good. And you see those things. It, it, it does a lot for you. It really does. And to, you know, to answer your question also, Dirk, it's, it's difficult um, as a pro or, or even as a local elite shooter kind of guy to walk into a local range for a, a local tournament and not have everybody go, son of a bitch, you know? So a lot of times what we'll do is if there's four or five of us or whatever, we'll put together a side pot out of our own pockets and just say, Hey, look, you know, we're going to, we're going to shoot for our money over here. You guys shoot for your money over there. Um, because you, you don't want to run them out. You know, you don't want to push those guys out. You want to, you want to make sure that they're, they're coming to, they're coming to play and they're coming to watch, but you got to make sure they have, deep down inside a, a chance or a thought that they can win right nobody wants to donate every single weekend especially on the local level whether it's 20 bucks or 40 bucks or 60 bucks to enter a, a local shoot you know nobody wants to give that away every single weekend um so that's where you as 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 your local pros you know you're you can say hey guys look you know let's all go and there'll be four or five of us. We'll put fifty bucks a piece in the pot, and winner take all, right? And let let everybody else shoot for their money, and and we'll just have a pro pot on the side. And you know, Great Lakes, 
um, has been insanely successful by doing that. Uh, the Great Lakes Division uh, of the NFAA, they have the, the strongest by far professional group in the entire country because they worked really hard at marketing the pros without shunning the amateurs um, and, and really keeping them involved. At the shop level, now, you know, as much as I want to pay everybody, I, I deep down, I, I don't think we should pay amateurs. I think it, I think it creates, I think it creates a problem. Um, because now we've got people, we got kids, you know, seven, eight, 10 years old that are winning money at tournaments and they're getting burned out by the time they're 14, you know, 15 years old, mom and dad can't hit the broad side of a barn, but juniors winning 500 bucks over here and getting a free bow over there. And, you know, they push and push and push and push and push. And, and, and you wind up driving the kid out of the game. And I, I, I don't, see a long-term success pattern for that um i i would rather if if, if i was going to set it up myself i would say pros can get money amateurs can get product and that's it um and from a from a vendor or a a company standpoint um dirk you know you you represent a vein company would you rather give 50 bucks to a guy um, so he can get McDonald's and $10 worth of gas on the way home? Um, or would you rather give him four packs of veins that he's going to put on his arrows and give to his buddies and give to his kids and give to his wife? And now you got six or seven people using the product versus 50 bucks that and you might never, ever, ever see them again. And the next vein company that offers 75 bucks instead of 50, guess what? He's scraping them off the blade and, and putting a new set on. So I, I'd rather see amateurs get equipment and, and, and take that and spread the love with equipment. Right. And I think, I think ultimately contingency money um, I would love to see the organizations take the contingency money and make it part of the paycheck. And then on the podium, you would have, you know, here's a thousand dollar check for the winner. Um, and it doesn't matter what they're running. Um, here's a thousand dollar check for the winner from Flex Fledge. Well, he shoots blazer. Yeah, but he won this tournament. And we agreed to give the winner a thousand dollars. So there, there's your thousand um, dollars. So I, I would rather see that because now, and and understand my reasoning behind that is now you didn't give money to a guy who won. You had the big Happy Gilmore check on the podium for every single picture taken by every single company, whether it be Matthews, Hoyt, PSE, First String, Axel, NFAA, uh, ASA, every single picture has the Flex Fletch Happy Gilmore check in it because that's what you agreed to. Here's $1,000. The winner gets to hold this check in every single freaking picture. I don't care if he's shooting blazers or whatever else. I don't care. Here's a thousand dollar check. Make him hold it. And from a marketing standpoint, I think you'd get more more mileage out of that. Um, I, right? I guess because nobody turns down the BMW because they have a Cadillac contract in golf. <laughs> they they take the BMW. So uh, you know that I just I think there's more effective ways to do it and 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 I, look i know i'm going to get some pushback from the amateurs but um i don't think amateurs should get paid i think it should be pro only and if you did that you'd have a huge pro division and we would be able to pay guys 20 30 places deep and you'd start seeing paychecks like grant and i saw 
25 years ago when you won 50 grand at three tournaments a year, not one tournament a year, right? So. Thanks, I, hey, Chuck, I, I want to make sure we get a couple other questions in. Thank oh, I'm you. sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Dirk, Dirk, thanks for that question. Is there anybody else that has a question they want to get in tonight? Yeah, Tim, this is Mason. She reaching yeah. out. I wanted Go to ahead, talk Mason. on steps moving forward from progressing from the local level to the national level. And I don't know, I've had a few conversations with different companies when it comes to shooter contracts. And some have been in between of what level to give and others talk about just staying a staff shooter. I'm trying to understand if that's a benefit as a shooter moving forward when it seems like each one I've talked to, all they want to do is see you sell their bowls in your local shop. Uh, all right. So what's, what's the question or what's the conundrum there? I'm, I'm trying to understand the benefit as a shooter to like just trying to sell a bowl for these, the archery companies that are offering these contracts. Uh, you mean how, so where, where do they find your value? Yeah. And where do us as the shooters find value into working with them? Well, ultimately I think you need to pick no matter what gear you shoot. I don't care if it's arrows, veins, bows, strings, sights, rest, whatever. If it's free and it sucks and you can't win with it, don't sign the contract. Period. End of story. All day long. Don't do it. If you can't win with it, I don't care if they bring you a tractor trailer load of it for free. It's worthless to you. Right. At the end of the day, ultimately, you need to perform and and performance comes in two ways uh how did you do when you were shooting right did you execute well did you land in the podium did you land in the top five did you break a record did you really do well did you give them something that they can use in their marketing did you get a couple of good images that you can send off to your handler and say hey um I finished third this weekend. Uh, I went to a shoot off and I got beat on the last target by, you know, Joe bag of donuts. And, uh, but I looked really good and I shot really well. And uh, here's a couple of images. Thanks a lot for everything that you do. Right. Or did you suck? Did you have equipment failure? Um, did something awful go wrong? And when that happened, did you, continue to walk around the course and be a cheerleader for everybody or did you throw a temper tantrum or did you go back to the booth let's say you're in vegas just for example did you go back to the booth and go man my bow blew up uh who needs lunch man i've got nothing to do for the next three hours so uh you guys got to take a pee or something like that can i get you a coffee what do you, do you need some help in the booth can i talk to some customers you know you can there's a lot of value uh, from vendors and they will remember that. They, they, that's a cherished, cherished gift. When any shooter walks up and hangs out at the booth for a few hours and just interacts with customers, because now if I, and I can tell you this because I've been that vendor, I've been the guy that's behind the booth and I can tell a guy all day long, this thing's the greatest thing since a pocket on a shirt. But I've got a shooter standing here who's competing with it. And he's an amateur and he can look at you and go, yeah, dude, this thing is the rat's ass, man. I freaking love this thing. And now you guys get into a conversation and that has so much more uh, delivery and so much more impact that the vendor can't relate it sounds like a sales pitch coming from me it sounds like a real uh, uh a real testament coming from them so so there's a lot of value there now if you don't go to these big tournaments then you need to make friends with the rep that's in your region if it's a bow company or arrow company or whatever and find out hey man um are you doing 
uh, dealer days? Do you need somebody to set up a tent? Do you, do you need somebody to go to a shoot with you and hang out for an afternoon and, and show the bows to the customers or whatever? There's a lot of things that you can do as a shooter that bring value. And then that rep goes back and says, hey, I don't know if the kid can shoot worth a damn, but he's always in the booth and everybody loves him. Well, that brings a lot of value. And Grant, I mean, how many times have we been at tournaments where, you know, you're just sitting in the booth. The next thing you know, you're two hours deep into a conversation with a guy and, and who knows, he might go back and, and buy two or three bows. Uh, you, you don't necessarily know that, but the, the vendors and the manufacturers see that. And that's where that additional value as a pro comes in. Now it's really hard to break through that shell, especially the last couple of years in the industry. Yeah. You really have to be somebody special. You really, you gotta know people. And if you don't know people, you gotta get to know people. You have to, you gotta go to your pro shop and say, hey man, who's the rep? How do I get in touch with them? I don't, I'm not gonna ask him for anything. I just wanna ask him if he needs help. Um, hang out at your local shop. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't translate up to the corporate level a lot, um, but the reps definitely do. And going to tournaments where the reps are set up, that's a big deal. And that'll get you, that'll get you up the chain in a really big hurry. That'll, that'll move you up the chain, right? What do you think, Grant? You think you agree with that? I do, fully. Um, being in the shop alone, Know, the couple of few shooters that I've had come in I ask them to come in and they come in on their free will and just hang out in the shop for half half a day when they have time and just work with customers talk to them about the product I give them the knowledge they need I give them everything that I can to help them make us win and and being on that same level Mason um, I remember trying to kind of break in when I was an amateur like man why does everyone have all these deals and why don't I well I'm an amateur. They don't, they, at, there was a point where amateurs didn't matter. Um, no. Now amateurs are what pay for me to shoot. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I mean, we don't, these manufacturers are, are in the day, uh, 10 years ago, manufacturers money was a little more abundant and the ability <laughs> to give away to yeah, us okay. as pros was there. Now it is not everything has gone up everything from cost of goods to employees to shipping to you just name it it's all inflated and these companies have to find new ways and have to spend more money to give us the technology and to give you the technology to make these better now i don't i n i've shot for hoyt and i've shot for matthews and i shot for martin for a while um, none of them have expected me to sell their bows None of them come up to me and said, man, how many bows did you sell this week? Now, I've been fortunate enough. I've worked in shops where I am selling them. They're, you know, even in, even in, and, you know, my owner, Dan, he could probably contest to this more, but I think we've seen, and I've had the reps tell me, man, I've seen an uptick in sales since you've been there. Now, I'm not the only contributor to it, but I do help with that. But I also know there's companies we have that pay our bills. Those are the companies. I mean, we, we back our companies as much as they back us. Because they're the ones that ultimately pay my paycheck in the end. It's not the customers walking in the door. I just help them decide on what they really want. And being a staff shooter of any level, from being a field staff to a pro staff to a pro pro, you, you promote what you know and what you can do. Like Chuck said fully, I, I've shot some stuff like, man, I, I just can't get these to shoot. I can't, I can prove and lay down and show you the difference. And I can show the owners of the companies. Here's the difference. Look, boom, boom. And I mean, I've had the point where the owner came in and said, let me do something for you. And they did. And it made a difference. But then he also says, I can't do that for everyone. So how do we get you to the level you need, you need to be at? So then it, it just, it's that conversation with those guys. You don't always get those with the owners, but I've been fortunate enough to have that. And being there promoting the product and not promoting you everyone else promotes you it you don't have to promote you the biggest thing uh, the two little things quick that i could add is that 
one as any type of staff shooter take what you can get because there's a day where you will you will no longer get anything so be thankful for what you get and take what you get and be honest about it that's your biggest quality the other quality is no matter what no matter what level of shooter you are everyone's looking at you to the point being as chuck just said are you the guy that slams the stabilizer down after missing an x and swears and then walks back throws his hat stomps upstairs and then comes back down and acts like nothing's n- nothing's wrong. There's kids watching you if you're a pro. If you're an amateur, there's pros watching you. There's other kids watching you as an amateur who look up to you going, man, that guy can shoot. He can shoot just as good as the pros can. That biggest thing, I had one instance when I was younger where I lost my stuff at a, just a local tournament. And I had a guy, Lou Melanese, pulled me aside. And he said, you can be two types of people. And he just sat to me and he said, you can do this all day long, throw your tantrum and be a little kid. Or you can turn around and smile and every single person out here will respect you way more than they did for you throwing that tantrum the one time. And ever since then, I haven't. I have, I have had some awesome scores going and Chuck's been there. Everyone's been there. You have an awesome score going. Next thing you know, one arrow, one arrow. That's it. It's over. And for us, yeah. as now for us as pros, you go to Vegas, it's twenty five hundred dollars, three grand you're dropping just to oh, yeah. shoot. Yeah. And one arrow, one arrow by a sixteenth, a thirty second of an inch costs you more than any of that. And you get nothing back. And now again, so some of the pros do have incomes that they get outside of it. But me as the weekend warrior, not having the income, that's all impactful. So then on top of all of that mentally prepare yourself for that because if it happens you got to put a smile on your face and try to walk back and pick up your bow and shoot again you got to try to pull your arrow out of the 10th row behind the bales <laughs> you want i forgot about that one <laughs> yeah i uh yeah i had a i had a loop break on me and there it was up in the seats and uh i was like oh and of course we couldn't go get it. So it was there and I shot first thing in the morning. So it was there all afternoon. And I was like, well, I guess a smile something... on your face, right? Chuck. The whole time. Oh yeah. I laughed about it. And, uh, I was like, well, I guess I'm done. And, uh, we just tied a new loop on real quick. Cause somebody had some in their quiver. And, uh, I was like, well, I guess I'm going to shoot the super early line on Sunday. And I was, I think I was like five bales from the end and I'm pretty sure I was the only one that spoke English. I know it was, I was the only one that could put an English sentence together. Um, so you'll have those weekends. It, 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 it happens, you know, it's, it's like NASCAR. If you race long enough, you're going to blow a motor. Just, yep. it happens. It sucks, but it happens. Well, we've been going a while here. I want to give a chance for maybe just one more question. Is there one more question we can answer quickly? I don't want to hold people too long. I have a question. All right. World record holder, Zoe Thompson has a question. <laughs> oh, really? No, tell me what's your record, Zoe. Um, I, so I was at the Buckeye Classic in Ohio, and I was doing a shoot-off. No, not a shoot-off. Um, Elimination rounds. Yeah, and I shot a 149 out of 150. See, this is why I don't want to shoot against the kids. <laughs> <laughs> and Zoe, were you, was that Cub? Cubs? uh cadet cadets yeah USA. so world world record holder zoe thompson with a question go ahead congratulations is there an age requirement to be a pro yep all right give it to us chuck <laughs> uh uh 15 is what we're looking for uh and the reason how old are you zoe 15 <laughs> so you need a uh, do you do you need a do you need a mentor, Zoe? Because I think I know a guy. <laughs> yeah. Tim, sounds like you're on the you're on you're on the curb. <laughs> so um, yeah, the reason we're looking for that is um, we actually had to do some research into uh, child labor laws, and we mm-hmm. found that uh, 14, uh, the government gets really testy about how many hours uh, a kid can be doing something for money. And what we learned was there could be some complications if, 
let's say you were in Vegas and you got put on a late line or an early line or something like that, there was there there could be uh, some what they call exposure, which is legal liability. Uh, so we made it fifteen. Um, I, I I'm really hesitant to bring young people in as a pro at that age. I'm very, very selective. I will not tell you no, not right out of the gate. Um, but if you want to turn pro, uh, me, you, mom, and dad are going to have a, a pretty good conversation. And I'm going to probably talk to your coach as well. Um, because one of the things I worry about the most is pushing you out. The, the pressure at the pro level, I mean, clearly you have the skills, right? And clearly we would love to have uh, somebody like you um, winning Vegas in the pro women's ranks. It's, it's pretty amazing when a kid does it like it happened once before um, last year. Uh, it's, it's really, really alarming. Um, and it sets the world on fire and it's really, really cool. Um, but there's a lot of baggage and a lot of weight that comes with it. And we just want to make sure that you're ready for it. So um, on one hand, yeah, sounds like the skill set is there because what uh, cadet you said, right? Are you shooting yeah. 30? Are you shooting 30 or 50 or 50 meters? They put you at 50 for that. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's banging. I shot. Did you do that this year at Buckeye? Yeah. Yeah, I was there. That wasn't the greatest weather ever. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty stout shooting. So the kid can shoot, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, if you if you want to do it, then yeah, we we should definitely talk. Um, it it's a great step forward. Um, but it but it comes with it comes with some weight. So thanks, Chuck. Be, I, be a lot I am fun. assured by I'm assured by Paul Parsons. He has one quick question. All right, Paul. I'll take as many as you got. Okay. Hey, thanks, Tim, for the invite for putting this out there. But uh, for your pros, when you were an amateur, you know, th there is stress levels when you step to the line. I get that. Been through it. But can you briefly describe the huge difference when you were an amateur stress level stepping the line versus going pro? like right at that tipping line when you went into pro. Um, and then can you compare it to now shooting at the line? Um, as an amateur, my early experiences, um, I never felt pressure, right? I never felt like I had to do well. I never felt like anybody gave a crap how I did. Um, just me and my buddies, and that was about it. And we would bust each other's butts over beers at the end of the day, and that, that was about it. And when I turned pro, my coach told me flat out, he's like, dude, you're not ready. You, you have no business turning pro. And I did. I was like, no, I can handle it, man. It's no big deal. And I fell on my face. Um, the very first pro tournament I ever signed up for was indoor nationals and they had us alphabetically and it's me, Dave Cousins and Jesse Broadwater on the same bail and Jesse Broadwater shooting pro tours at a blue face. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me right now. I remember that. And I... I don't know how I got the first five arrows off. I, I have no idea. I shot a really good score. I shot a 59 X that day and I was ecstatic. Um, I got my butt handed to me, um, but I was ecstatic. And it, and it got worse for a few years because as a pro, you think everybody is watching you. You, you have it in your head that, everybody wants to know what grant how did grant shoot today how did chuck shoot today nobody gives a how chuck shot today everybody <laughs> wants to know how levi morgan shot everybody wants to know how jesse and dave shot nobody gives a crap about how i shot once i learned that 
And once, and it was probably, oh gosh, only three, four years ago that I was able to put that behind me and, and realize that nobody really cares. Like, like really, nobody cares. On the pro line, none of the pros, I don't think, I, I don't have any memories of this, where they, where they like outwardly judge you if you have a bad day. They're just like, how'd it go? Uh, not so good. Yeah, I dropped a couple myself. Yep, yep, you'll have that. And then you go on and you talk about your business. Um, and it took me a long time to get over that. And once I realized that nobody cared more than me, the game got way easier. What do you, what do you, do you agree with that grant? Yeah. A hundred percent. When I was an amateur, I just, just shot to shoot. I honestly, I was just making my mom and dad happy. I, I loved shooting and it was the only thing I was good at. I can't throw a football. I can't catch a baseball. I can't dribble a basketball. I drool more and I dribble. I can't do any other sport except for not handsome archery. I know. Um, <laughs> so I remember at Vegas in 2004, when I won it as an amateur, I was shooting against Tim Gillingham and Forrest Carter in Bonner freestyle. And I had two arrows to go. I had to shoot two tens. That was it. Just tens. And Forrest was behind me by one point. If I had a shot a nine, I'd have tied him. Tim was two points behind us. Um, and I remember I was shooting Carter releases and I wasn't shooting gold tip arrows yet. I was the year, the next year, but, um, I, I wasn't. And I remember my second arrow trying to load my release and my hand was doing this and I couldn't click my release on, I couldn't put it on. And I was like, I've never been this. My legs were shaken. Uh, your, I mean, your heart you, is, is gone. It's, it's already exploded. So I made my two shots and I won it out, outright. I shot an 899 that year. And then Bowen Freestyle, that's still a star score. There's been a couple of 900 shots since then. But so Not I bad. won that. And it was, it was awesome. Then in 07, when I turned pro, I remember having the confidence walking in there. And it was always my goal, still is my goal to this day. And I have re realistic goals, but I also have the goal that when I walk into a tournament, it's my tournament. This is my house. This is where I live. This is where I shoot. This is my 20 yards. This is my target. This is mine. I'm winning this. And whatever happens, happens. I mean, I've had days where I've shot seven down. It just, if you have that day. But every time I shoot, that's, that's the way I approach it. Because approaching like, oh my God, Levi's here and Jesse's here and Chance is here and, and Louie's here and um, uh, Braden Hempen's here. I mean, I mean, all these people you got to worry about and Brady, sorry. And, you know, just all these people you got, you got to worry about. And when I went in in 07, I remember I shot my first 300. I was walking around with one of my fellow pros, Bruce, Bruce Williams. And uh, he's not shooting anymore, but he was back then. And he was an awesome dude. I miss him so much. Um, he uh, was taking me around introducing, introducing me to com companies, you know, like, hey, I want you shooting with someone this year. He was pushing for me to, to you know, get shooting, getting sponsors. And uh, I remember talking to the guys at, at Excel. I don't remember the guy's name. It was a long, it was a long time ago. I'm like, so what's so cool about these sites that I want to shoot one of these sites versus my check that I got on my bow right now that's working just fine, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and this is a 2007, a check it is so old. But anyways, and he goes, well, because it has this and has that. And he goes, well, who do you shoot for? I'm like, I don't shoot for anyone right now, but I'm shooting in the pro, pro class. Oh, okay. Well, well, if you do good, let me know. And I'm like, well, I am. I'm going to shoot a 900 this weekend. I mean, I flat out told him to his face. I, I, I was doing it. And I did because I knew that weekend, I knew what I was going to do with that boat. And, uh, and I did. And we had conversations afterwards. And um, when it was all set, said and done, that was a, that nervous there. First, it was just the nervous of being there. Same thing, same thing, release hand, everything, all that yards. But then a year or two into it, it's exact thing. I don't want to let anyone down. So I get, that's always been my biggest downfall to my existence is I get to a tournament. I got 50, 60 people back home rooting for me, want to know how I did, sending me texts and like, man, I dropped one today. I'm out. Oh, you know, you're still doing good. You're still my favorite, blah, blah, blah. I, I appreciate that. And I do, I really do. And it's never been that, but man, you just feel like, I can't believe I did it again. And, and it happened again and again, and it does play a toll on you. But I still walk into that next tournament I'm winning it. This is my tournament. This is my house. 
And now, now I go in, it's like shooting like I was back when I was six years old with a bunch of buddies on the line. I mean, the, 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 the best example I have is this was three, four years ago now. It's probably been, it was before COVID. I was down in Metropolis shooting ASA. I don't shoot 3D because I suck at yardage, judging yardage. And even when it's fixed yardage, I still don't aim very well at a foam target. But I went down there to shoot anyways with my buddies who wanted to shoot. And we're walking through Walmart, 930 at night and in the middle of, of, of Kentucky. And who's standing there is Levi, Levi Morgan. And I've known Levi for years. So for me, it's no big deal to walk up and have a conversation with him. And, uh, and I, not even one bit of nervous, but my two buddies, you know, Levi Morgan is like next to the president, like just top, the, the guy to meet, like their favorite, they watch all of his videos, they love him to death. And I see him like, hey, there's Levi Morgan, should we go say hi? We can't say hi to Levi. I'm like, yeah, we can. No, 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 we can't. I'm like, come on. And I just go walking up to him, I shake his hand, we talk, we talk about family, barely even talked about archery. Because I know as a pro, last thing we want to talk about is archery. When we're shooting, maybe, but when we're outside, family matters. You know, all this life matters. So we're talking to everything. I'm like, and, and I'm just waiting. And I can see these guys biting their nails, getting all nervous. And I'm just like, I go, hey, uh, by the way, these two guys, they're, they're madly in love with you. They think you're the best thing since sliced bread. I told them you got nothing on me. But anyways, I'm like, these, these are the guys. I introduced them. And he was super nice. I mean, he just, he was everyone knows Levi he's great with people you know and he was super nice about it to the next day they were sitting in my truck waiting for me to come out and Levi comes walking by and stops and talks to him and says hey man how was your guys's day he gets his picture with him and everything and I mean these guys were can you believe he did that and I'm like that's why he's a pro that's what pros do you do that for others so yeah it, it does you do have the nerves at the beginning and then you have the expectations but if you have realistic expectations they don't take over your shooting. Your shooting ability just happens. And then the more you shoot, the more it just becomes natural to shoot with all these guys and you're just having fun. There's no pressure. There's pressure of winning the tournament, but that's your own internal pressure, not pressure from peers. And like Chuck said, not one time have I ever had any pro come to me and go, man, why did you shoot today? Why are you even here? You know, I've right. never had that at all. Right, right. I mean, it, and that's, you know, it was Paul, right, that asked that question? Yeah. You know, the, the biggest thing, Paul, um, especially, are you, a, are you a senior or a master now? Yes, I, I shoot senior bow hunter freestyle. So. Oh, my boy. <laughs> yeah, so you'd have, to, you'd have to go into open to be a pro. Um, Got to put a scope on there. Well, I mean, you can shoot. Actually, that, I mean, that's not mandatory. You can shoot a bow hunter rig against the the open guys. You're more than welcome to do it. Um, and I've I've had my butt beat several times by a guy with a bow hunter rig. So I, I'm sure not going to challenge anybody to do it because it's happened bad. Um, but it's in in our division in the senior group in the senior division or or at USA Archery what they call the Masters Division. Um, man, it's a great group of guys. It's, it's a hell of a lot of fun to shoot with those guys. They, most of them have been around for so long that they're, they're just there to shoot their bow and hang out and have a good time. And yeah, hopefully one of us wins. And, you know, if, if it's not going to be you that day, most of the time you're standing there being a cheerleader for the guy that is winning. Um, the, the hardest part is making the shift when you decide to go pro and, and pushing it out of your head that everybody's watching. Yeah. In the shoot off in Vegas, there's 5,000 people in the stands and they're watching, but on any given weekend, nobody really cares. I mean, they'll, they'll talk about the top two or three guys, top five guys, talk about the top five women. And that's it. That's it. If you're in 15th place, unless you're supposed to be in first place and you had something terrible happen, nobody's paying attention there. And that, that's the hardest thing to get over as a pro is thinking that everybody is paying attention 
Um, and, and, and really they're not, they're, they're worried about themselves or their own game. And, and that's the hardest thing. If you can make that transition, then turning pro for you is going to be a piece of cake. You're just going to, you're just going to pay a higher entry fee and wear a fancier shirt. That's it. It'll still be a hell of a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Thanks to you, Chuck, for uh, that symposium that we did this summer. I think I picked up a few extra points on your release uh, demonstration there, and I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I'm going to wrap it up. Um, Grant, where, uh, besides stopping in at A1 Archery in Hudson, Wisconsin, and doing some shopping and talking to the uh, resident pro there, Grant, uh, what else? Is there anything else you'd recommend people check out, Grant? Uh, don't go to YouTube. Stay away from YouTube, please. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. Except this video, which will be posted there, and yeah. you guys can all Dang. link to it and share it with your friends. Uh, Tim who? Uh, anyways, <laughs> um, no, there's, you know, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to to shoot for some really good good companies, and, and you know, now's not really not the time to plug them, because we all, we all know that, but I'm telling you, there's there, we need more people to get back into the tournament sanction. We need to bring more kids up. We need to get more people involved. Um, it's not a dying sport, but COVID took a lot out. We had I, the small examples in our academy. We had over 60 shooters. We have eight now. Um, we lost a huge chunk just because kids are too busy. There's too many things going on. And yep. unlike, unlike like Zoe, who's solid into it and does it irregardless, there's people that just give up and move on. And I can remember as a kid, man, I, I shot with, we had a, we had a Friday night line. We had 50 shooters on a Friday night where we had two, two different line times. The first line time was all kids, all kids. Mm -hmm. We had 25 shooters on a line all by themselves. And it was just all kids, all of them under 16. And now me and two other people still, still shoot of all those kids. And it's just, it's, a, and again, it, everything changes in life, but it's just amazing. We, we used to go to state in Wisconsin. We'd have uh, 75 shooters. We'd be almost half of the people that showed up. Now there's a dozen of us, but I mean, we still get 280 shooters at our state, state tournament. We get a lot of shooters in Wisconsin state. I'm telling you, that is one of the hardest states to win. And, and I'm sure every state feels this way and in their, in their own way. But I mean, in the last... So since Dwayne, since Dwayne and Lee really kind of started it by shooting the going into the pro pro class, Dwayne's shot three perfect scores. Joe Cox shot one, Don Ward shot one. I've shot uh, four now, I think it is. And our class, it's 119 or 120. And uh, you don't, you don't even come close. Even the amateurs are there. We, we just, I feel like to be in been, Montana. No. Those guys, but yeah, they're no. they're 450 league night. You have to shoot like 43 X's to be yeah. in the hunt. Yep. <laughs> like, yeah, Montana's stout. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those so those that's what I mean. There's each state's got, got its own. And I just um I, I just the big thing for me is I just want to get as many people as I can shoot. And I want to keep people shooting, I want to keep people in it. I don't, my biggest thing when I teach people and work with people is I don't want to tell them to do something. I want them to understand why and the difference. Because if they know the difference of why I'm teaching them to do it from what they were doing to what they could be doing, then they understand, they learn and they grow and they share that with others. So that, that's my, my, my biggest thing. And, you know, I, thankfully this year I get to get back to shooting. Um, I get to go to Vegas again, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and then uh, we got state after that, Wisconsin. We got sectionals. We got nationals. I won't make Lancaster, unfortunately. As the stages hit at an elder age, um, that costs a lot of money. Vegas is enough and doing two archery, like that. Yeah. Archery is not an inexpensive sport. You know, I, nope. as much as I want to keep people in, that's, that's kind of the big fallacy is people are like, well, archery isn't expensive. Meh. It is. It is. If you, if you want to be at the upper levels, it is. Yep. Um, you can do it inexpensively, but at some point it, it gets expensive. By the way, Zoe, 
are you going to Vegas? I sure am. I, I want your autograph. I will shoot you for a signed dollar with Grant in Vegas. <laughs> All right. Huh? All right. All right. And Some money on the line. <laughs> and after, af after you win, because I'm old, um, I'll, I'll turn that dollar into a 20 to give back to you. Okay. <laughs> so Chuck, I want to, I want to hear from you. If people have questions that they didn't have time to ask, how can they reach out to you and what, what contact information should we provide for you, Chuck? Um, Chuck Cooley Archer on Facebook. Um, you can try Chuck Cooley on Instagram. Um, I, I have a fledgling TikTok account also as oh. Chuck Cooley. <laughs> <laughs> um i'm trying to put some archery content in there but i'm also an optician by trade uh so you're going to see some optical videos on my tiktok um but uh yeah chuck cooley archer is really the best place to find me or my personal uh my personal facebook page chuck cooley although i i honestly i i don't accept very many friends because it's it's pretty much maxed out so do the chuck cooley archer thing and send me a message there uh or through my instagram chuck cooley i'll find you there um thanks that's, chuck. that's the best way to find me for perfect sure. and uh i just want to thank again thank everybody for coming out check out the minnesota archers alliance um our facebook page this this video will be linked on youtube from our facebook page and our website is the mnaa.org we just published our 2022 event calendar. So we're excited about that. We've got the Allstate Vegas shoot coming up in January and uh, Indoor Nationals coming up in February. So lots of stuff happening uh, for the MAA. And I just want to thank again, everybody for coming out. Grant, Chuck, thanks so much. And we'll see everybody around. Thanks a lot, guys. I really thanks appreciate everybody. it. I, I know it went long, but it was awesome. Thank you very much. Zoe, don't forget, autograph in Vegas. I won't. I'm I'll holding be there. you to it.